Hello everyone and welcome to our third and final Making Materials Matter webinar. My name is Helena, I'm the Access and Outreach Manager for the Department of Materials at the University of Oxford and it's great to have you all with us this afternoon. So let's get started. So let me hand over to our speaker today, Emma Headley, who's going to be telling you a bit more about the material science of batteries. So I'll hand over to you, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Helena. I'll just share my screen with you now and hopefully you'll see the slides. So um, I'm here today to talk to you a bit about understanding the challenges behind using lithium ion batteries, looking at this particularly from an atomic scale perspective on the structure of the materials. So as Helena already said, my name is Emma Headley. Um, I am from roughly here on the west coast of Scotland near Glasgow and I first studied at the University of Glasgow doing chemical physics and then I came here to the University of Oxford materials department to do research on lithium-ion batteries and electron microscopy which is what we're going to speak about today. So first I have a question that I would like maybe some answers in the chat if you have any ideas. So my question is, do you know anything that might contain a lithium ion battery? I can't see the chat right now. Maybe Helena could tell me if there's answers in it. I can't yeah, absolutely. Think. So someone said car and phone. Okay, yeah, we've got, we're getting there. Yeah. Phones, computers, electronic devices. That sounds about right, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. I think you've basically got the examples that I've got. So I've got electronic devices like laptops, larger things like electric cars. And um, yeah, any sort of rechargeable electronic power devices. Okay, that's great. So in this talk, we're gonna start by thinking about why. Why do we want to uh, research lithium ion batteries? What, how, how can we do this? How can we understand more about the properties of the materials? And then, what can we find out about them using this particular technique? So specifically, we're going to look at electron microscopy, which we'll come to later. So first, the why question. Why are they important? Well, I think you sort of already answered that because they're in all of the devices that we use every day and that we rely on a lot for um, like communicating like we are now. And we want uh, to move towards electric cars rather than petrol cars. So we need bigger batteries that enable cars to travel further. So how do they work? Roughly speaking, we move lithium ions across from the positive end of the battery, which we call the cathode, through the bit in between, which we call the electrolyte, which is where the ions can move through, to the anode, which is the negative end of the battery. And here the energy is stored as chemical energy with the battery in a charged state until we want to discharge it and release the energy as electrical energy to use it. So we can see the ions going back the way on the discharge. This is basically how the batteries work, how they store the energy. So why choose lithium? We choose lithium because it means that we can, it's light, and it can store a lot of energy per gram. So we want the lightest battery with the most amount of energy stored. There are lots of challenges in lithium ion batteries. So one of them is the suitability of different elements for the, the materials. So we usually our materials consist of a combination of different elements, but we, uh, we'll discuss the suitability of some different the elements for the materials. Also, we have degradation. So capacity means how much energy can it store? And usually the more we use the battery, the worse this becomes. So the capacity decreases, we call this degradation. And also safety, particularly the electrolyte part of the battery is flammable. And we want, we'd like to change this to a non-flammable electrolyte. Just for safety reasons, it's not generally a problem with our mobile phones because the battery is encapsulated in a hard case, which means um, that it's protected, but it, it could be an issue that it's flammable. And sometimes the reasons why we have to take certain precautions when we fly on a plane with devices containing batteries and things like that. And we see flammable stickers on packaging. We'll look at these two a bit later and we'll start with looking at the suitability. 
So we want elements in our battery materials which are non-toxic, so um, preferably not the red ones. We don't want we want things to be as light as possible because we want to store more energy per gram. And we also want things that are not expensive. This is a problem for two reasons, because we want we want things that um, everyone wants their devices to be cheaper. And also everyone wants these devices and we want to make more and more of them. So this is where natural abundance comes into play as well. So how much of the element is actually available in the Earth's crust, which is where we mine these elements from. So, but one problem we have is things like cobalt is, is very popular in battery materials. However, when we re remove the cobalt, we get poorer performance of the battery. And we want to understand why doing things like this actually changes the performance of the battery and linking the performance of the battery to the actual structure of the material. So this is the link we want to make. So we have these huge global sustainability issues around making cars electric and not using fossil fuels. And this is linked to the problems with um, how many times we can cycle our material or battery before the performance degrades to, to such a point. And it's also linked to just, you know, how much energy and how much um, your phone can store and how this gets worse over time and stuff. And we want to link these challenges to the atomic scale structure of the material. So the next question we have is how, how can we go about doing this? Well, Last week, if you watched, just make some random guesses if not, but if you did watch, you heard a little bit about electron microscopy. And I was hoping maybe you remembered what some of the differences between the optical microscope and an electron microscope are. So if you do, you can put that in the chat now. And if not, then maybe you can just have a guess. This, this, these images might give you some clues. I don't know, Helena, can you see the chat again? Because when I'm sharing a... Yeah, sure. So we're getting some some uh, answers in. People are thinking maybe they have different lenses. Do optical ones use lenses? Yeah. Lenses is a different. The type of lens is a difference. Yeah. Electron microscopy, much larger scale, more expensive, higher resolution. Yeah, that's a lot. That covers quite a few of them. So yeah, this image gives you a bit of a clue. The electron microscope is much bigger than the optical microscope. So what, what I've got here is size, as we can see here, cost, one fires light versus electrons. That's quite an obvious one. So one uses light to see things, the electron microscope uses electrons. The type of methods for sample preparation, resolution, and other things like the lenses, that is one. So. Um, the type of lens is different. Okay, so we'll talk, we'll just briefly mention resolution, because this is the most important one for our application and why the resolution of the electron microscope is much uh, better than that of the optical microscope. So roughly speaking, we have, so we have this equation for resolution, where D here is, the, by resolution, we mean the distance between two points. So the smallest distance that two objects can be from each other so that we can still tell them apart and we can say that they're two separate objects. So this bottom line of this equation, 2n sine alpha with the refractive index and the size of the lens are basically equal to one. So this equation becomes d is approximately equal to lambda. So we need a wavelength approximately equal to the distance that the two objects are apart to tell them apart. So if we think about the size of an atom now, we know that we can see that visible light with 400 to 700 nanometers times 10 to the minus nine meters isn't gonna help us when we want to see atoms. So what we use is high energy electrons. These have a wavelength much smaller than the atom and we can see the atoms. Just to get an idea of the scale of the atoms, what we mean is, by, by these sizes times 10 to the minus 10 meters. That sounds small, but it's hard to grasp how small. If we took an apple and blew it up to the size of the earth, then all of the atoms in the apple would be the size of an apple. So 
So that between the, the magnification between an apple and the size of the earth is roughly speaking the difference in, in uh, order of magnitude that we're talking about to see atoms. So they're very small. How do we see them? So the materials are usually in the crystalline form. This means that the atoms are in regular arrangements of columns and rows. And they're not just randomly distributed everywhere. I think Alex also mentioned this a little bit last week. So what we do is we fire the electrons at the specimen and the electrons interact with the atoms. They're mainly scattered by the nucleus, the core of the atom. So they um, interact with it and they're scattered. And we use this, this interaction to build up a picture of the atoms. So that's looking at the individual materials is fine, but you might ask, how can we cycle this into? How can we find information about our battery from this? Well, basically we start and we make a material. We take what we, a sample of it and we call it the pristine sample. We then make a battery, a cell, and we charge it up and we take a sample when the material is charged. We then discharge it and take another sample in the discharge. And we can repeat this process round and round, charging it once, twice, three times, even up to a hundred or a thousand times, taking samples of the material. And then we can understand how the structure of the material changes and relate this to how much energy we can store in the battery at each cycle. So now we're thinking about what, what can we actually see using this? Well, for example, here we've took the cathode of a battery. We've got, we have a layered structure in the cathode because if you remember the, the ions moving in and out during cycling, they need channels. So the lithium has these layers so channels for the lithium to move in and out of during the cycling. But what we see if we take cycled samples, so if these, these samples have been cycled in a battery multiple times, these perfect looking channels for the lithium to move in and out of the material, the surface gets all rearranged and muddled up and blocked and the lithium can no longer easily move in and out of the material. And this, is, this structural degradation is one of the reasons why our battery stops performing as well. So in the images shown before, we only really saw the transition metal, the heavy elements, and we didn't see the lithium going in and out of the layers in between. But we know that, that those layers are where the lithium does go in and out. So my research, I try to, to, to help give more information to this situation by understanding the position of the light elements. So we already said electrons have a wavelength. So we said they have a sort of wave-like property. The things that have wave-like properties also have this thing called a phase difference. So this is a shift between the peaks of the, a shift in the position of the crests of the wave. So if we take this phase difference, this can help us to see the light elements as well as the heavy elements in the battery materials. So here in the top images, I've shown you pictures where we can only see the heavy elements. And then below where I've included the phase difference in the electrons to help us see lots more detail so we can see atoms in between these layers, get a lot more information. And here we can link the what we call voltage hysteresis. So this, this is plotting capacity against voltage. So we can see the charging profile and then on the way back down, the slope is discharge. And when these lines are further apart, we, we're not getting as much energy back out of the battery as we get in. And so in this material here, we've got much more disorder between the layers and it's harder for the lithium to get in and out. So it's, the battery doesn't perform as well as this material on the bottom. So the other issue we said we would briefly look at is safety. We want to change our electrolyte from being a liquid to being a solid. However, when we do this, we have a problem that lithium can't move as easily between two solids. So the interface between solid particles has something called impedance. This means that the, the ions can't move from one particle to another easily. So we can actually image two particles which have stuck together and try to work out what's going on at the interface between the solid electrolyte and the cathode. So the electrolyte here is called the duodite and the 
NMC is the, the cathode that we're using here. And we can map using, this is using X-rays that are given out when the electrons interact with the sample. And these X-rays are distinctive to different elements. So basically we can map where different elements are and we can um, work out what side reactions and things like that are going on at this interface, which cause the capacity of the battery to fade. Okay, an added bonus of the solid electrolyte is that we can replace the anode, the negative end with lithium metal. This isn't possible with a liquid electrolyte because lithium can grow through the liquid electrolyte and short circuit the battery if we use um, lithium metal as the anode. But if we replace it with a solid electrolyte, then the lithium uh, dendrites can't move through the solid electrolyte and we can get more energy per gram from our battery. So we can get more power from a lighter battery. And partly this is just because um, we've got carbon here in the periodic table and it's much heavier than lithium, which is here in the periodic table. So um, replacing the anode from graphitic carbon to lithium is another advantage. So this helps us. Okay, in summary, why are lithium ion batteries important? Well, they're in all of our electronic devices and we want to upgrade to electric cars which travel further. We addressed that at the start. The next question we initially had was, what questions are there to be researched? Well, why do they degrade and how can we make them safer? We looked at both of those questions. Um, we looked at how can electron microscopy help us answer these questions? Well, it can help us to understand the arrangement of individual atoms in the structure of the material. And by doing this, we can work out what changes have occurred. And then we have, how will this improve batteries in the future? Well, if we understand the problems with current materials, and we understand why they're not as good as they possibly could be, then we can help um, to work out how to make new materials that don't have these problems and perform even better. And now we're going to take some questions, hopefully. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Emma, for that whistle-stop tour, introducing lithium-ion batteries, problems, how we can image them, and what we could possibly do to improve them. So if anyone has any questions, make sure to pop them in the Q&A. In the meantime, I have one. So you're talking about wanting to improve batteries for electric cars. What do you think is the most promising solution for electric cars? What do you think could possibly be the, the answer here? So the answer is coming up with materials that can store more energy in a smaller space and for less weight. Because the problem with electric cars is now the batteries are heavy and they take up a lot of space in the actual car. And the cars don't then travel as far as you would like because the batteries are heavy. So coming up with solutions which are make batteries lighter, take up less space, and also a little bit of the safety issues. Some people are a bit hesitant because they know the safety issues around lithium ion batteries. Um, but cars have been designed to be as safe as possible with these type of batteries in them. But coming up with materials which are just inherently not flammable at all would help. Great point there. Safety is a big thing for cars. Um, so kind of leading on from that, we've had a question from Georgia. Um, were there any better options than lithium or were they too expensive or too scarce or need certain conditions in order to work? So definitely on the scarcity, actually lithium's more of a problem than some other things. Um, but people have just not, the, there's research into sodium ion batteries and sodium is everywhere on earth. We have loads of sodium, much more sodium than we have lithium. But people have just not managed to make materials which make a sodium ion battery um, completely possible. So there's so many areas of research, not just in lithium ion batteries, but sodium ion batteries, and people are even investigating things like potassium ion batteries, both of which are more abundant than lithium. 
but yeah lithium is sort of the best we have at the moment yeah great so that kind of answers another question that we had where they're asking are you researching whether anything other than lithium could be effective and usable so i guess the answer is yes there is research going on into that right yeah yeah there's there's a lot a lot of research going on into different materials and probably in an ideal world we probably wouldn't use lithium it's a difficult thing to handle it's highly reactive there's not it's quite expensive and there's not that much of it around so yeah in an ideal world we probably wouldn't use lithium so is it the case with these these sodium ion batteries like are they at the level where they work but they don't work quite as well is that the issue yeah so i think they work on like sort of lab scale but there's absolutely nothing like commercial commercialized into um devices or anything like that yeah, because obviously that's a big thing, isn't it? Is being able to produce it at a commercial scale. Yeah, and, and on much larger scales. So the materials we research in the lab are often made on like tiny, tiny beakers. You get less than a gram of material um, and that's difficult to handle. And that becomes an even bigger problem when you want to make it in a factory and mm. you can't use glove boxes. So a lot of the materials we handle is outside of air. So we use boxes filled with inert uh, gases your noble gases and um yeah it's impossible to fill a whole factory with gas like that so yeah, yeah the, the handling issues of the materials become a much bigger problem when you try to commercialize the materials yeah that's really interesting so yeah not quite commercially viable yet um so we've had an interesting question here i don't know if you'll know the answer to this or not or if it's kind of like a, an open discussion but are there any options for using kinetic energy to charge portable lithium ion batteries or I suppose any batteries? I mean, there is, so the way you charge things using kinetic energy is, is so through movement and you, you can charge very small devices, but not, not really by a battery method. Mm -hmm. So you can have materials which can generate some electricity when they're, um, when like pressure is applied and they're moved in certain ways you, you can in some ways get some energy that way but i don't know of a solution where it's stored in a battery but yeah i think that's a really interesting concept though isn't it yeah <laughs> so good questions that's the sort of question that, that you listening might one day be able to solve <laughs> um okay and another question here which is another really good one how easily can lithium ion batteries be recycled and how environmentally friendly are they? I think that's a really good question. Yeah, so this is another big area of research is how can we make these more recyclable? So the problem with things being recyclable, the, the, the recyclability of the lithium ion batteries at the moment is all the materials have lots of different elements combined in between them. And there is the electrolyte and there's separator layers in the electrolyte and it's really difficult to take all these things apart and recycle them individually. So, yeah, the biggest area of research and recycle them individually, um, because that's the same issue you have with like when you want to recycle coffee cups, mm -hmm. is that like the plastic is in with the paper and they're all mixed together and getting the bits apart to be recycled is, is difficult. So yeah, they're not very recyclable at the moment, basically, <laughs> which is an issue. Yeah, especially with um, lithium being as scarce as, as you were saying. Yeah, so we've got lithium and usually things like cobalt, and uh, which are also rare and expensive. Nice. So if no one has any more questions, I think we can probably wrap it up there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was a really good talk. And thank you for answering those questions. And Thank you all for coming.